Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to your fifth day in C programming. I hope you've been enjoying the series and in this lesson we're going to be talking about something that you might miss from other programming languages. That is, if you've been programming before in a language like JavaScript or Python, you might be missing in C the string data type. Now that is that in C there is no built-in string data type. In fact, there's no string data type even in a standard library like in C++ where you have a standard string implementation. So how do we get by with representing strings in C? All right, that's what this lesson is about, and let's go ahead and dive in to see the answer. So the good news is strings themselves in C are quite simple. So C strings are actually just arrays. And arrays are something that we've worked with previously in this series and throughout many of the lessons here. So I'm going to go ahead and just create a C string, which is a array of characters. And what I'll go ahead and do is just set the size of this to well, something reasonable like this. So let's go ahead and store a bunch of characters here. So hello, and I'm writing out each of the individual characters here. So for hello, we need uh, five total positions, and that's the length of this string here. Now, there is one caveat, though. How do we know when do we stop this string? How do I know there's not more here? Well, that's where we introduce in C a sort of sentinel value, or in other words, a null terminator. So there's one character at the end of a C string, which is just an array of characters. And that's the backslash zero here, which is the null terminator. So the actual length of this string is six characters total. It's just that often we don't count this last character because it's implied or assumed that it's the end of a string. So let's go ahead and see how we create a C string, and we'll run through a few examples of how we can use C strings in C. So what we're going to do is create an array here. So if I know that this string here is exactly going to be six characters, uh, then I can go ahead and set it up as follows. And finally, the null terminating character. All right, and then I'll close the brackets here. And then let's go ahead and print out this string here. Now the format specifier for printf is percent %s. So you can remember that like string, that's actually one of the specifiers that makes sense here. And our string, which is hello here. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and compile this and run it. And here we can see our hello. Now in a function like printf, for example, Again, to answer how do we know when we're done printing all the characters, well, we're essentially in the printf function going to walk through a set or one of these characters at a time, and then finally output the characters or all the characters once we see the null terminator uh, that appears here. All right. Now, because a C string is just an array of characters, we can actually change these characters as well. So let me go ahead and modify this. And let's use something else, maybe my name, for instance, which will be used in five characters. And just one at a time here, let's go ahead and write out each of the characters here. And I'll go ahead and copy this here. And for each of the individual positions, write my name out here. And again, at the end, the null terminating character, so we know we're at the end of our string. And let's go ahead and print out our name here. So I'll go ahead and recompile this. Um, oops, this is actually just a uh, name here. <laughs> Jumping a little bit ahead of myself. Here's the name. Uh, Mike printed out here. And as mentioned before, I can print this out again, but this time I could change one of the characters. So if I change the very first characters to something else, an N pops to mind. Uh, if you're into shoes, maybe you've bought a Nike shoe at some point in your life. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so you can see that we can mutate or change the individual characters because, well, this is again treated as an array. So again, because we have this array here, which is just a contiguous block of memory, let me go ahead and write name here. And we are pointing to this block of memory here. So this is essentially a pointer. So what does that mean here? Well, are pointers and arrays the same thing? Well, 
sort of, but not quite. Um, and I'll be a little bit more specific about that um, in a future lesson. But the idea here is that, well, name here just allocates five characters again on the stack. That's where we are creating our C string. And the name is the symbol that points us to the start of this string. And then we can walk through each of these characters one at a time. And then once we reach the null terminating character, then we terminate our string, meaning that we can finally print it out. So if I wanted to write a function here to compute this string length, let's go ahead and do that as an exercise. And you can go ahead and pause the video and try this yourself. And in fact, what you're going to want to do here is write a function called string length. And I want you to think about what the arguments are going to be, uh, the return type, and how you would implement this. All right, so if you've gone ahead and paused the video at this point, let's go ahead and implement string length function. All right, so we know that we need to take in some sort of string here, and it's going to be characters of something. But because this array here, whether in this case it's just allocate on the stack, is really just a pointer to five characters on the stack in a contiguous block here, we can point to that particular string here. And this is our input here. So I'm going to go ahead and close our brackets here. The return type is going to be some sort of length here. Okay, so what do I need to do here? Well, I'm going to create some variable here called length that's going to indicate the length of our input string. And while in our input, the length or the character that we're looking at is not equal to our null terminator, then we will keep incrementing the length. And then finally, we will return the length of our string here. So that's the idea of our algorithm. Now let's go ahead and test this out and see if it works here. So even when I, after I change the name here, percent %d for integer, and we'll call our string length function with the name. And we'll go ahead and recompile, rerun. And we can see our string length is four here. So you can see the algorithm on top and how this works. Now do keep in mind, we are not counting the null terminating character here. And it's a little bit more intuitive for us, for example, if we have our block of memory here, when we see things like Nike here, and the null terminating character that we really just care about these four characters here if we're reporting the length. Now, this is something to keep in mind when you're working with strings that you might have a plus one if you're trying to figure out what the total length is of the allocated memory to include this null terminating character here. That's the backslash zero. So that's just something to be aware of when you're working with strings in C. Now, Something to be aware of is this function here, string length, is actually so common that the C standard library actually does include some functions for working with character arrays or C strings. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is split this window here and show you the str len function here, which is a function for calculating the length of the string. So very con convenient with what we are learning here. And just to see how the string length function works, you can see that it calculates the length of the string pointed to by s, that's our input here, excluding the terminating null byte. So again, even in the C standard library, which is where these functions are included, str len, short for, for string length, you can see that they don't include the terminating character. Now, there is something kind of interesting when looking at the C standard library and how they've created their functions versus, well, what we've learned so far with how we've created our functions. In fact, our functions are doing the same thing, but they look a little bit different regarding the input parameters and the return type. So I briefly want to talk about those and improve our string length function here. So the input here, we don't want to change the actual input. In fact, all we're doing is reading or looping through each of the characters in our array. So a way to ensure that we're not going to change our input, and thus a programmer who is passing in a pointer doesn't have to worry that our value might get mutated, is to make it const. So const makes a value read only. So for example, if I make this const here, and I'll try to change our input, let's just say I'm being malicious and changing it back to Mike, because I want to be back in the string name. <laughs> and if I recompile this, you'll see we get an error that says assignment of read only location input. So input is a pointer here, it's a character pointer, but because it's const, we can't change it. Its value is constant. 
Okay, so once it's been assigned one time, we cannot change it. So let me just make a brief note of const here. So const means variable is read only, not reassignable when uh, after assignment. After assignment here, I'll get it in the corner. There we are. All right. A fancier way to just stay that is again, you cannot change the value. So that's a little bit better here. So how else can we improve our function? Well, there's this thing called size underscore T. So what is that exactly? Well, int could be a negative value. And you could ask yourself, could I actually have a negative value? So I could just make this unsigned, for instance. And what often we do to indicate if we're measuring the size of something, since, well, it's sort of implicit that the size cannot be if you have some sort of quantity less than zero. So size t tells you that information. So we're using the type name here to tell us we're measuring some sort of size or quantity, and it would never make sense for it to be less than zero. So we're going to use size t here, and I'll make our length size t as well. And let's go ahead and compile this and see if we get any errors here. I suspect we're, since we're using a different type here with our string length, we might have at least a warning. So, and in fact, we do. So usually our warnings are pretty good and are going to tell us what the format specifier that we should be using. And this is some sort of long here for uh, size T. So let's go ahead and correct that. And we'll use percent LD for some sort of long uh, unsigned integer here. So it actually gives us the type for size t. So this can store a really big integer that must be positive, long unsigned int. OK, so let's go ahead and compile, rerun, and we can see our output successfully done here. All right, so that's working a little bit with strings here. Now we're not quite done talking about strings here. We've got a nice function here that we're going to just keep in mind here. But does it work the same way if I dynamically allocate my string? So instead of doing char name, Let's go ahead and create a char star name. And this time I will malloc. So malloc size of the char. And I need five characters to store this string here. One, two, three, four, and five. Because again, I need to include this null byte here because I need to know where the end of the string is. All right, and since I've allocated my name, I should also remember to free my name because this character here, pointer, points to a chunk of memory on the heap that's always going to live until I free it. All right, so let's go ahead and recompile. And looks like I've got um, a few errors here, or rather warnings here, because, well, I didn't include standard lib for malloc and free. So let me go ahead and do that. Standard lib, and this is for malloc and free. All right, so if I go ahead and compile this and run it, the same results because again I'm just passing in some series of characters in an array doesn't matter if I've allocated them on the stack like previously or on the heap using malloc it's the same because it's just a chunk of memory and depending on how long we want that chunk of memory to live we use malloc or we just do things on the stack now Speaking of how long things live, again, the heap with malloc being long lived versus the stack, which are short lived things, there is another type of string here that I can talk about. So let me go ahead and uh, close this uh, help here, which again, you can use the manual page. And there are lots of built in string functions, things like concatenating strings, uh, copying strings, or even looking at various tokens or comma separated strings and breaking out all the individual strings within those. So those might be some handy functions for you to know about. All right, but this other type of string here that I want to talk about and a long live string. Now I've told you there are no built in string types. There are only C strings here where we have a character array. But the truth is we do have something else and it relates to how we store these strings in memory. And what I can do is create a second thing here, name two, and this is called a string literal. That means it's a literal string that exists in memory. 
So let me go ahead and just comment this out so you don't have to be uh, bothered by it and show you how to create a string literal. So what I'll set this equal to is hello world, something like this here. All right. So what exactly this is, is in memory, there is hello world stored here. So let's go ahead and print that off. And we don't, you know, free this anymore and see what that looks like here. So it is, again, a char star here. So let's go ahead and compile, compiles, and it runs because, well, it's just a regular string. This time it is between the double quotations, so that's a little bit different here. So let me go ahead and clear off my whiteboard and introduce this idea of a string literal. And it is what it sort of sounds like. It's just literally a string, the memory representation. Hello, world. Okay, now I don't see a null terminating character here. So I don't see this one here. And that's okay. C, and I'll make some uh, notes here, puts in the terminating character for us. So I don't have to put this here. It's already there implicitly. Okay, so I can use other functions that we've learned about here. So let's go ahead and calculate the length of our name here. So I'll go ahead and run this here. And we get hello world, and this is 12 characters long. Again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and does not count the null terminating, which is the 13th character that actually lives there. All right, now can I change things in my name too? So if I want to change this to an uppercase H, for instance, let's see what happens. And if I try to run, I get a segmentation fault here. So what happened? Uh, well, what exactly is going on here is string literals cannot be mo modified. So string literals cannot be modified. They are actually const. So what we actually want to do when we create our string literal is in general label it as const here. So if I try to run this code here, it'll actually prevent me from getting the segmentation fault that I previously got. Now let me rewind a little bit here because that's something new and maybe confusing. Here's the code that I had. It compiled because C just sees this as a character array. It doesn't know what's stored in it because this is just some pointer here on the stack that's going to point to a chunk of memory. That chunk of memory happens to be a literal string here, hello world, and we're trying to reassign something that, well, I've defined as read only here to H, which we're not allowed to do. So really, when we create our string literals, we want them to be cons like this. OK, so again, if this is something that I can't change, why is that? Well, why is the case? Well, what I'd like to introduce to you is a tool here called uh, Godbolt here. Uh, it's called uh, Compiler Explorer at Godbolt.org. And I'll show you an actual string here on the left side and the string literal here, which I'm storing. And on the right side is the actual assembly code. And it's color coded, so you can see the green uh, matching up with the main and the yellow matching up with this instruction here at line six. So the left side's the C code. And remember, the compiler that we use, GCC or Clang, for instance, compiles this C code into an assembly version. And this assembly on the right side is the machine or the rather human readable form of machine code, meaning that each of these instructions, push, move, and so on, translate to some number that the machine understands. So this is essentially as low level as you can get programming without just writing in ones and zeros. But that's a further aside, and we'll talk about some assembly soon enough. But what I want to point your attention to is this dot string here. And you can see Boston, and we can see Boston here, the string literal. So at this location here, which is just a label here, there is some string stored, or rather it's baked into our actual program. Our actual binary here, prog, 
uh, at the bottom left corner has this string Boston, or in this case, hello world, inside the actual binary code. In fact, if you wanted, you could disassemble and look into the program and find that string. And I'll leave that sort of disassembly task to a future lesson here. So anyway, that's why we can't change our string literals. So they're const by default, and we can't modify them. In other words, the way that we should create these is by making them const because they're stored in a read-only section of memory that's stored inside of our executable. And it sort of makes sense when something's stored inside the executable, like prog, that it can't be changed while the program's running. So for instance, if you download a program, you don't want certain sections of it to be modified, like a virus, for instance. So anyway, that's the difference between string, literal, and regular C-style string arrays. So automatically puts in the terminating character for you, so you don't have to remember, and that's by convenience, and it cannot be modified. But otherwise, we can use them and read from them like regular strings or access the individual characters. OK, so that's on string literals. So sometimes you're going to see, for instance, string literals passed into functions. So for instance, if I just get rid of hello world here and I don't have anything, I can just still pass this directly in here, hello world, and I can recompile. Uh, oops, let me get rid of uh, this line here and just compute the length of the string literal here that's being passed in here, which remains 12 characters as in our previous example. OK, so now that we understand C arrays, C strings, and are starting to get a handle on that, let's go ahead and look at writing some functions for working with strings. Now, I've already wrote one here with the string length, and I'm going to go ahead and leave this here because it's nice to have as a convenience function. But what I want to write, and sort of a challenge that you can pause the video and work along with, is a function for string append. Or you'll see this as stir cat in the library. So there's going to be a little bit for you to think about here, but I want to give you a chance to think about it. So go ahead and pause this video and resume if you'd like to see me work through a solution. So hopefully you've given this a try to try to build string append. And again, what our goal is going to be is to take two different strings here. One, because we're going to be modifying it, is a string like name here. So for example, uh, and let me create this as an array of five characters here for uh, my name here. And I'll use uh, Mike here. Or actually, let me use uh, hello. And we need the null terminating bytes here. And if I instantiate it that way, I can just use the brackets and C will figure out for me how long that is. Six characters. OK, so what I want to do then is call my string append function. I'm going to need some sort of input here, so some input string, and maybe the string or the source that I am appending to it. And I could do something like world, for example. And that would be good here. So what does this look like? I need an input of a char star. And this is going to be changing. This is my destination, or rather my uh, input. And then I'm going to need my source, which is not changing. And that's going to be const, because I don't want to modify anything with this string. So I'm going to append and print out hello, and world would be the output here. OK, so we'll have to think a little bit about the return type, but let's think about that as we develop here. For now, I'll make it void. And again, we can think about that, or you can think about your solution here. So the first step I need to do is compute lengths of input and source. Now, why do I need to do this? Well, again, anytime we're designing an algorithm, we should think a little bit or draw on paper. So what I've got here is one of my strings on the top here. And this is going to be hello. And it has the null terminating character. And my goal is if I am appending, so adding world to it, and I'll go ahead and put this here. And there is a space in front of it here. So let me make sure I represent that. Zero, one, two, three. Or let me write this a little bit nicer. So it should look something like this. And then if I create a new string, It'll just be one block of memory here with hello, space, world, exclamation, and the null terminating character here. Okay, 
Uh, and this is going to be our actual array here. And let me separate this out here just character by character so you can again see. And we can see the actual size here. Okay, so I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, a space here, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 for the null terminating character here. So if I'm going to reallocate memory for this uh, destination or our input, I should say, and our source is unchanged, then this is my new input. So I need to reallocate memory in a way. Now, how can we do this? We have a tool called malloc, uh, which I'll use first, and then maybe I'll introduce another tool here called uh, realloc, which we can also use. But let's just go ahead and start by computing the lengths here. So I've got my input length, and I can make these uh, size t's again, which equals the string length of our input and the size t of our source. I'm going to abbreviate this SRC because sometimes you'll see SRC in the uh, C standard library functions, which is short for source. Now, I prefer a good variable name like source uh, because it's a little bit clearer, but I'm using SRC here just because that's what you'll see in the C library. And in fact, I'm going to make this uh, destination because that's uh, similarly the naming conventions that you'll see in the C library here. So that'll be the destination. Okay, string length and the source. Okay, so once I have each of the lengths here, I need to allocate some memory here. So I'm going to malloc the size of a character times, well, the destination length plus the source length plus the one null terminated character here. So I don't want to forget that here. And this is going to be a new character array. So it's a pointer to something. And this will just be called the new string. OK, and let's go ahead and put this uh, on one line here so you can see everything. OK, so this is our new buffer or storage for our combined or concatenated string. OK, so that's the idea that we're going to be storing there. And now our goal is just to be able to walk through, so one character at a time here, and copy in each of the characters here. Okay. Now we'll have to be a little bit careful when we get to uh, the null character, for example. And, well, we don't want to do anything with that. We just want to walk through the length of our input, walk through the length of our source, and then we'll handle the null character at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and handle that case. So what we'll go ahead and do is uh, I need some sort of counter here. I'll use i. I'll set it to 0. I'll say, well, i is less than, well, the destination length. That's our first string. Then we want to copy in each of the characters from our destination at i one at a time here. All right, and that should do the trick there. And then we'll want to do the same thing for our next string. So copy in first string, copy in second uh, source string into next portion of buffer. So let me create another counter here, j here, and I'll say while j is less than the source length, src length, then we'll increment j. And where are we writing to? Well, our new string length at, well, wherever we left off with i, or I could use destination length plus j. Okay, so let's go ahead and then copy in the source string starting from j here. And I'll go ahead and save that, and that should do the copy here. Now, again, we need to uh, add our null terminating character at the end. OK, and let's go ahead and give this a try here. And let's see, where do we want to write this? Well, our new string will be at the destination length plus the source length. And that's the end of our array. And we make sure that it's the null terminating character. So 
this is where we might have some off by one errors and we have to be a little bit careful. But we've allocated enough memory for the length of two strings plus one. So the very last position would be the length of each of these strings. So let's just go ahead and look at this uh, in our diagram. So again, hello is one, two, three, four, five, six characters. Uh, space world exclamation mark is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, characters. So essentially at the 13th index uh, or 13th position, uh, let's see if I missed um, an excl uh, point here, uh, should be 12. Oh, and that's actually because I miscounted here. We have five characters. That's the actual uh, length. Okay, so that'll give us our 12th position here. Five plus seven is 12. Okay, so that looks good to me. So let's go ahead and look at our uh, code again. Now, what's going on here is also kind of interesting because remember the destination is our new string. So we do have to reassign it here. So let's go ahead and say that our destination is now equal to the new string. Okay, now we're not quite done, but we can go ahead and give this a test just to see what happens here. So I've appended my string here. And let's go ahead and print it off here, percent %s, and we'll run our uh, name here, because that's what we are modifying, and let's see what happens here. Let's see if we are done here. And, um, oops, I've got to uh, just make sure I name my function, uh, not spring, <laughs> it's end, append, but uh, string append. All right, and then we're good to go. All right, so if I run this, uh-oh, it's running forever. So there's a infinite loop somewhere. So I probably need to increment um, i here in this loop. And you're going to see me iterate this um, a little bit here. In fact, this is probably more code than I've wanted to write without saving, compiling, and testing, but uh, that's how it is. And, hmm, okay, well, I just see hello here. So we're going to have to think about where did I write maybe um, something where it doesn't belong. Or is this a problem? Did I actually copy the destination to the new string here? What happened here? Well, this actually takes us to a previous lesson where we've talked about things like pass by value. And the reality is this destination here that we have, if I change where it points, does that actually change the uh, string here. Well, let's go ahead and see if we've made a mistake here. And one way we could do it is actually by taking our uh, destination here, just changing one of the characters here to capital H here or something of this nature here, rerunning it, and hmm, it seems like we, we can modify destination here. So we should be able to point to a new uh, chunk of memory. So that looks okay. So perhaps we just have a off by one error here. So let's go ahead and just um, add here. Or rather, well, I don't want to add anything. But maybe I should think about the point that I had brought up earlier where what is our actual return type? What are we returning? Well, we want to return a new chunk of memory here. So what we've got here in our destination, this is the pointer that stores something to our new string here. So let's go ahead and return our new string here. And I'll go ahead and point it uh, as follows. And we should go ahead and return char star. Okay, so we'll have to change a little bit how we call this function here. And that our name is equal to the new appended string here. So let's go ahead and uh, give this a try here. And this is just a uh, capitalization error. So I'll fix that, rerun, and well, we've run into another issue here where it says assignment to expression with array type. So again, this is where we can't just reassign this here because this is some sort of array here. So let's just create a pointer that's going to point to our chunk of memory. That's the new string here. And I'll just call appended name. So let me go ahead and rename this here. Appended name. All right, let's go ahead and give this a compile. 
a run, and we see hello world. Okay, so again, this will go to a later discussion of arrays not being the same thing necessarily as pointers, especially when we think about where they are allocated. And this will have to do with, well, knowing how large this actual array is and thinking about the things that we can repoint it to. But we were able to get a pointer to our character string here. All right, so there's a few design decisions that you can make with this string append. For example, you could have this be a destructive operation where we delete the memory that's pointed to here. It depends on what your implementation is going to be. I want to go ahead and take this moment to bring up the actual strcat function, which is interesting to look at here, and see that we have something very similar, where we have a string concatenation with a destination and a source here. And in fact, if we go ahead and read through this, we will go ahead and see that this function takes some source and it stores it in the destination. Now this destination buffer in the actual C library will, uh, it enforces that it has to actually be big enough to store both the destination string and the source string that are being concatenated together, which is a little bit different behavior than a string appended, which our function returns a new block of memory with the destination and the source here. So with that in mind, um, I don't need to actually change the destination string. And I'm going to just rename my arguments to something a little bit simpler. I'll do source1 and source2, which will append two strings and retrieve another. Now I'll go ahead and just change the variable names here. And then this will just change the behavior of our function a little bit to append and create a new string with source1 and source2. So it's a little bit different than what's going on in the C library. Now, the reason for me showing this, and hopefully you also were able to achieve some sort of function that appends two strings together, and maybe that returns a new string, or in one of the destinations it fills that buffer. It is something that you do have to think about. And C programmers for a long time thought about this or used strcat knowing that the destination needed to be some buffer or array that was big enough to store the source string. In fact, I'm going to show you an implementation here in the code that makes this very efficient and simple to implement. So you can go ahead and try this implementation if you'd like. Now, the reason this is a little bit dangerous, and you'll notice there are a lot of duplicate C string functions like stir with an n in the middle of it and then concatenate where the n is indicating the number of bytes of the destination buffer. And this is a safety check to make sure that destination is in fact large enough for us to store the contents of both source and destination. So again, we're just thinking about things in terms of bits and bytes as always with C. So uh, I hope that was an interesting uh, exercise for you to learn a little bit more here. So let me go ahead and um, run this one more time just to confirm that it works. And I'll go ahead and um, change some of these variable names here again to source one length and source two length, just to be a little bit uh, clearer about what is going on here. Source one length and source two length. And then we should be good to go. And we've got to again set up our null terminator here. Just one length, oops, one length plus source two length. And if I go ahead and just take another quick look here, I've got a few more to replace. Source one length and source to length. How did I know I had more to replace? Well, the uh, autocomplete uh, showed me <laughs> some things existed. Okay, so here is our final uh, program here uh, that'll actually run. And we can see hello world here. Now, we do have to, of course, uh, free our appended name here. So we are good to go there. And I'll go ahead and run this and we'll see hello world. Now, we've got two handy functions here of working with strings. 
And strings, again, are quite fun to work with because you can think about sort of iterating through each of the individual characters and making sure that things work here. Now, I want to go ahead and introduce some other functions here, like with malloc. Uh, we can actually do something that's a little bit cheaper than using um, malloc if we want and just introduce the function realloc. And what realloc does is it takes in a pointer and we can reallocate the size here. So what is this going to actually save us here if I am doing realloc instead of malloc? Well, what it saves us is we don't have to do this first copy of the string because whatever the pointer is that we're passing in is actually going to be copied by default here. So let's go ahead and use realloc. And the size that we are reallocating to here, the second parameter, will be um, the same. But the first parameter is going to be our source one here. And then I won't have to do this copy here. OK, so let's go ahead and recompile. And hmm, looks like I uh, got an error here. So I just need to make sure I write realloc instead of remalloc, um, although that's what it's um, doing. And if I run, hmm, looks like I got a core dump. And well, why did this happen? Well, again, let's take a closer look at realloc, the function here, because this is something that you might run into. We got something about a bad uh, pointer here. So if we read through the realloc function here, it says it changes the size of the memory block pointed to by pointer to size in bytes. OK, so we have some other things here that we need to uh, keep in mind here. But if we get to the bottom here, it says that we must have used or made a call to malloc somewhere. OK, so if we're reallocating something that has been malloc well, let's look at our memory here and see, did we actually malloc uh, our memory that we're reallocating? Well, this is reallocating source one, and we're essentially making this bigger to include source two. And hmm, well, this name here that we're passing in, this was never malloc So what we're going to have to do is change the setup of our code a little bit here, char name. And this is going to have to be a pointer that is malloc here. So char malloc size of one character times, again, hello is one, two, three, four, five, six characters long. And I'm going to have to write out individually each of the uh, hello here. So I have to just do this like such. And I still want to make sure that this is a null terminated string because some of our other functions uh, internally depend on this, meaning the actual functions like string length, for instance. So let's go ahead and again just set this up. And I'll make sure not to forget my null terminating character at the end here. And now when I pass in name here, Let's go ahead and compile, and I'll try to run, and now it works. All right, so we have reallocated this block of memory. Now, again, we still have to be a little bit careful here. We've done a nice job in terms of shrinking our function down here, of reallocating. But what happens to the old memory in source one here? So this is where I got a little bit ahead of myself here. But once we have our new string that we are uh, returning, something that we might want to think about is, do I have to free this string source one or do anything with that? Well, in truth, we actually don't have to because reallocate will take care of that by giving us a bigger block of memory to store two strings uh, in this block and release uh, source one here. OK, so that's a little bit of a more efficient uh, operation. Now, let's get slightly more efficient with our string operation here. And I'm doing a copy of the source to string into the next portion of a buffer. So what this really means is, again, I really want to just take this whole source buffer and copy it over here. I know I'm going to be doing this sort of one step at a time. So how can I do this in one step? There must be some way in C to do this. And in fact, there is a handy function called memcopy. 
So let me open up the manual page for this, and we can see that there is mem copy. Now it exists in string.h, which is kind of handy, and I can copy some source into some destination and some size here. So let's go ahead and see how this works here. So I'll have mem copy. My destination, well, where am I copying to? Source one. My source is source two. And the number of bytes that I'm copying are source to length. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here because if I'm copying my source into source one here, that would copy it at the start. So we do have to offset by whatever this length is, and that's the buffer that we want to copy into. So let's go ahead and add to source one, well, whatever source one length is. And source one is a pointer, and this is effectively going to shift us however many characters over that is source length. So I can get rid of this bit here. So copy in source two into the new string after source one. Okay, so I'll go ahead and recompile and let's see if we got this included. Well, this time it is asking for string.h. So I'll go ahead and include string.h. And this is explicitly for mem copy. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. And just like that, hello world still works. And you can see how I have reduced some of the code by knowing a little bit about this library. But let's keep pushing this a little bit further. The str length function we don't need anymore because I've included string length. So I can just use str length. So I'm going to just shrink this a little bit more to do str length. And now I'm using the standard libraries functions. I'll rerun and recompile. And again, we'll get hello world as an output. So that's quite a bit of time spent on string append, but you can see the different ways that we're moving memory around, whether copying it manually one at a time or able to do it a chunk at a time using something like memcopy. Okay, so what I'm going to do, go ahead and do now is shift gears as we wrap up the lesson here. And I want to again just show you why it's important, whether we're using a malloc string or a string on the uh, stack to see why we need this null terminating character bit. So allow me to go back just a few steps here and I'll get rid of our keep allocated stuff. In fact, I'll get rid of a pen string and let's just work with name for a few moments here. And I'm just going to go ahead and create a character array. And we said we needed six characters here. And let's go ahead and do this, um, something like this here. Now I'm creating a new scope here with the curly braces. And the purpose of this is so that when I come back here, this is where this goes out of scope here. In fact, let me make sure that uh, name is in here. And this is just a new scope. Okay, so name will only exist within this bracket and this bracket here. So let me go ahead and compile this and I'll run it. And well, we see hello as expected. Now let me go ahead and just get rid of the null terminator here. And in fact, I'll just leave it empty. Or perhaps just uh, give a, another character here, like an exclamation mark. And let's go ahead and see what happens if I run this. And I'll compile it, and well, I get hello, which is fine, and that's interesting enough. But what if I go ahead and later in my program, I try to create another string? Because you're saying, Mike, the null terminating character was so important, but you used it here, and I still got hello, and it was OK. Well, later on in my program, so in a different scope, new scope, new set of curly braces here, I'll go ahead and create another array. And I'll call this name two, and this is just gonna be two characters here. And let's just go ahead and say I'm, you know, putting in some characters here. And again, I'm being a, you know, a little bit careless here and not putting the null terminating characters, maybe by mistake or it's just been a late night or whatever. And let's just go ahead and print out name two here. So let's go ahead and see what happens. Uh, let me make sure I uh, use name two here. Name two and name two. Okay, so go ahead and observe the different scopes here that each of these have been allocated, both on the stack and somewhere in our memory. 
So if I go ahead and run this, notice something very subtle here. I get hi-lo in one and hello in the other. Okay, so what is going on here? This is particularly interesting here uh, to me and a great way to wrap up the lesson, at least for why to have the null terminating character and justify you know, all the interesting things we've learned about strings. Because you're likely to write your own string op operations, things like string append like we did, or string length, or so on. So in this first example with name, I've allocated on the stack here, hello, H-E-L-L-O, and a exclamation mark. And then when I leave scope here, that is within this region here, all this memory gets reclaimed automatically. But it doesn't get erased. It just means it's available to be overwritten. So the next time I do something on the stack here, which I'm showing here, I allocate something else, I get two blocks of memory, which happen to be, well, H and E here. And I overwrite these as H and I. Let me go ahead and do these in a different color, H and I. And then I'm going to keep proceeding when I print off my string well, until I find that null terminate character, which might just happen to be outside here. A lot of our memory happens to be zero, so we got lucky. But it could have been anything or anything else that we've allocated on the stack. And that's really dangerous if this had happened to be, uh, and I'll do this uh, as a last example here, uh, do a little substitution where I switch name with, let's say I was storing a password instead. So if I ran this, program, I would be able to see perhaps part of someone's password, which is just the word, you know, hello here. Or perhaps let me go ahead and give uh, something that's all too common, but probably a bad habit of people just putting in uh, numbers like that. And you can see hi, three, four, five, six. And now I've got part of your password here because someone forgot to have a null terminated string. So so with that said, folks, this was a monster lesson on strings and perhaps talking about what strings are character arrays, the difference between a string literal and a character array, and how they're stored in memory, and why we can't change string literals because they're const. Then we looked at some functions like writing append string and also a string length function just to understand how to move through and navigate strings. And we made our append string function a little bit more efficient by looking at realloc, which saved us a little bit of copying, and another powerful function called memcopy, which will just copy a block of memory at a time rather than iterating through in a loop all of the memory. And then finally, we looked at how, again, if we forget the null terminating character at the end of a stack allocated string, and by the way, this will be the same if you have a heap allocated string, that, well, when we try to print something off, we'll just keep looking into memory forever and ever and ever and ever until we find that null terminating string. And sometimes that results in printing off additional characters. So folks, if you enjoyed this lesson, make sure you comment and like and subscribe below. And in those comments, go ahead and say something that you liked or perhaps talk about one of the favorite string functions that you found that you think might be useful and what you think it might be useful for. Thanks for your time and we'll see you in the next lesson.